Okay, thank you very much for coming to this week's museum research seminar. So I'm delighted this week to welcome Jose Fernandez Chiana. Um, Jose is joining us from the Canadian National Collection of Insects in Ottawa in Canada, where he is the head of Hymenoptera. Jose did his biological sciences degree in Santiago de Cuba uh, before doing an MSc in agroecology in Sevilla in Spain. Uh, he then returned to Cuba uh, for his PhD in agricultural sciences and entomology. And he's been doing research based in Canada since 2006. Um, and during this research, he's published more than 150 papers describing about 500 new species and 28 new genera of parasitoid wasps. And I think he's gonna talk about some of those species and some of those genera today, probably, uh, from all over the world. Uh, he's currently the president of the International Society of Hymenopterists, so very happy that he's visiting the entomology collections here in the museum and uh, looking forward to hearing what you've got to say. Jose, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Um, I've been asked to speak in English, and I will do it, but uh, my mother tongue is Spanish. Y yo estoy muy orgulloso de mis raíces latinas. Por lo tanto, yo también voy a estar hablando un poquito por ahí, por ahí en español de vez en cuando. But most of all, I will comply with the English part. So um, this is the outline of the talk I will be uh, giving today. Um, I'm assuming some in the audience are not entomologists. So let's talk first what are the microgastrinia parasitoid wasps. Um, everyone knows hymenoptera, hormigas, abejas, um, eh, avispas. So parasitoid wasps are a bit more than half of the hymenoptera right now, although they will be way more when they are a better study. And uh, microgastrinia is just one small group of parasitoid wasps. It's a subfamily of the family Braconidae that has 22,000 species, and it's a family of the superfamily Gnomonoidea. So microgastrinia represents right now about 2% of all hymenoptera and 4% of all the parasitoid wasps. They are relatively easy to recognize because of some morphological unique characters like the fixed number of antennal uh, flagellomeres and the position of the spiracle in the metasoma, in the abdomen. Um, they are the most common, important, diverse group of parasitoids in caterpillars. People get to know them very well as a group, but then there are too many species in, in reality. The genera are poorly defined and there's an insufficient and incorrect biological information. This is just a sample of the microgastrinia wasps, although I must confess I chose the most beautiful one. So these are the fashion models. Uh, the regular microgastrinia is kind of black, uh, nothing special. But what they don't do in morphology, they uh, more than make up by, because they have a lot of fascinating things behind them, which I will be talking about uh, soon. Starting with this statement that is not up to debate, these are the most, the group with the coolest names of all hymenoptera. For example, starting with the common name in Japanese, which is uh, Samurai Komayubachi, which means Samurai Braconid Wasp. So it doesn't get cooler than that. But yes, wait a second, it gets cooler than that. So we have a genus named after the child from the Lord of the Rings, and we have a species named after Bilbo, Frodo, Sam, um, pee -pee and, 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 and even talking, uh, and we have the mythical Godzilla wasp, which is actually I recommend you to go to Google after this and search just Godzilla wasp. I didn't bring the video because I was afraid it didn't work in the presentation. So this is a wasp I described from Japan back in 2018. It goes underwater, underwater, and pushes the, uh, some aquatic caterpillars out of the water and then it emerges out of the water and parasitizes the caterpillars on top. So it looks like Godzilla coming out of the water, and it's from Japan, so we have to call it, uh, to name it uh, Godzilla. But for those of you who are hungry, because we are close to the uh, tiempo de comer, 
So uh, there are even wasp names after the key lime pie, which I described from Florida Keys, which is the place where the key lime pie dessert was made. And I'm a chocoholic, so I had this was from Thailand that uh, the second metasomal segment looks a bit like, let me see if I can, uh, I forgot how to use this. Anyways, um, it looks a bit like one of the triangles of Toblerone. And of course, you have this koala wasp. That one I didn't describe, but um, it was described because it parasitizes a caterpillar that uh, it's inside of the koala poop. And then you have a, a tiger wasp, a jaguar wasp, etc. But to top it off, so the microgastrine wasps, the larvae coming out of the caterpillar, are probably the inspiration for the original Ali, Ali, alien movie, Alien in, in Espanol. Alien movie from 1971, and the even better cult classic comedy Spaceballs from 1987. I actually selected this less bloody scene to show the alien coming out of the, of the artist. Silly, I mean, leaving behind silly, silliness and, and fun things, and I'm guilty of most of these uh, names, so I'm not a really serious researcher. You probably have seen most of these uh, caterpillars at some point in your life if you're in the field. You probably have seen some caterpillars with these kind of white cocoon masses. National Geographic even has a video about this process using one of the most common um, um, caterpillars. Um, well, what is fascinating is that these wasps have a symbiont virus that is injected by the female wasp when they lay the, their eggs into the caterpillars. And this virus manipulates, it disrupts the immune system so that the immune system of the caterpillar cannot kill the eggs of the, the wasp that later on hatch. And so the larvae stay inside of the caterpillar, allowing the caterpillar to grow. So this was discovered in 1981 with microgastrinia wasps. After that, it has been found in other groups and recently, like um, um, 2022, late 2022, there was a paper saying that apparently there are more lineages of Hymenoptera that might have these endogenous viral elements. But while most of the groups of Hymenoptera have a few taxa that have it, the entire microgastrine has it. And in fact, the entire microgastroid complex, which is a, a group of subfamilies of Braconidae that um, I have put in blue the, the current diversity of a species for every group, and in red, the estimated. So you see microgastrinia is by far the largest group. In 2008, uh, with the data available at the time, it was uh, estimated that this group ar ar arose around 100 million years ago. We are about to publish a paper this year where we are pushing a bit uh, farther, uh, around 120 million years, and microgastrinia, which at the time was supposed to be 53 million years old, is about 80 million years old. And this is important because this is more or less in line with the rise of flowering plants, which was followed by the explosion of um, Lepidoptera, which was followed by microgastrine parasitizing the Lepidoptera. So you have a tritrophic level co-evolving co more or less at the same time. I mean, give, 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 it, give it or take a few million years. And microgastrine parasitizes uh, most of the Lepidoptera. The, the blue rectangle are all the lineages of Lepidoptera that microgastrine parasitizes. The, only the four most basal ones are not parasitized, and they are parasitized by these other groups of uh, braconids from the um, microgastroid complex. And the data we have so, <clears throat> so far um, shows that these are the most commonly found families of caterpillars that are parasitized by microgastrinia, but there's a, a bit of bias there because these also are the families of Lepidoptera with the larger and easier to find caterpillars so because humans are the ones who collect them. Uh, it's a bit biased. Uh, but what we do, know, we do know for sure is not biased is that whenever you do a comprehensive study of caterpillar parasitoids, invariably microgastrinia always come as the most abundant and the most diverse group. This is from around 600,000 caterpillars collected in Area de Conservación Guanacaste in Costa Rica uh, for the past 35 years, and microgastrine is uh, the, the largest group. 
the rest of hymen larger than the rest of hymenoptera and inner the dakinid flies combined. So uh, what we do know is that they are mostly specialists, and this relates with the fact of the um, same bion bi virus that they, they inject. So they need to be specific to be able to disrupt the immune system. So for example, in 2014, we studied the, the genus Apanteres, which is the largest genus of microgastrine in um, Mesoamerica. 90% of the species are monophagous or oliphagous with some. They usually tend to parasitize few species in the same genus or related genera for sure in the same family. Uh, we even know of lineages, entire lineages of microgastrinae that are restricted to a family like this Fornitia, which they look like a tanque de guerra, like an ar armor tank, and they parasitize another very armor uh, caterpillar, Limacodide, or Alphomelon, which in Greek means white cheeks because they have these white uh, things on the head, on the face, and they are strict parasitoids of Esperidae. We have some exceptions, and sometimes they are related to ecology. For example, I discovered this species in 2018 that is attacking four different Lepidoptera in two different families, but they all share together that they all are feeding on Douglas 4. So it's basically, um, it's attacking all the caterpillars that eat on that plant. We have the genus Poletesor. By the way, this is the, the common looking microgastrini. These are not the fashion ones. These are the, the, your day-to-day -day microgastrini. Uh, the genus Foletesor parasitizes different uh, miners that might or might not be uh, phylogenetically related, but they, they tend to be on the same plant. So they have some sort of niche spe specialization. But we do have a few really crazy polyphagous microgastrini, like this one is in Europe, all over Europe, uh, including Spain, parasitizing an immense host range. And we don't know what is what, what is the unifying factor because it's mostly macrolepidoptera, but not entirely. It's mostly low elevation, but we don't know what's going on there. We also, um, I discovered in 2016 that, for example, the same genus can switch, um, can have different hosts in, in, in the new, in neotropics. This genus, Exorisa, parasitizes the uh, Gelekid moth, but in, in the oriental and eastern Paleartic region, it parasitizes uh, pyralids. Um, and we even discovered that depending on the region, there might be some switching of families. So the genus Micropletis and Snellenius, which are, are very related, tend to switch the hosts in different geographical regions. But by far and large, we are still in the initial stages of knowing the host parasitic associations. I could come here and leave this slide and say, hey, we have recorded so far around 5,500 host parasitic associations involving 3,500 pyoptera, 1,200 microgastrine. So we know a lot, look at these big numbers, but when you actually look at the reality that there's 160,000 pyoptera, probably two, three times more, and there's probably 50,000 microgastrine, and we are expecting that at least half of the species of caterpillars are parasitized by microgastrine, we really have to paraphrase Socrates, solo sé que no sé nada, we really don't know anything yet because what we know is so few that whoever tells you is an expert on microgastrine, it's lying to you. So let's move to a different topic, the third topic of my talk about global diversity distribution patterns of microgastrine. I became, I became obsessed with the ratios of microgastrine and lepidoptera around 2009, and at the time I was finishing a paper on Canidia microgastrine, and I realized that uh, there seems to be some sort of correlation between the number of Lepidoptera and the number of uh, microgastrine, which in a way makes sense because they are strict Lepidoptera parasitoids. I forgot to tell that before. Uh, so I mentioned that in 2010 and 2013, we revisit that with more data from not only from Canada, but from England and Germany, Hungary, Russia, Sweden, Costa Rica, New Zealand, and we still found the same remarkably. This, what I call in 2010, the lepidoptera microgastrine ratio seem to be more or less the same, regardless of the geographical region, regardless of how big the area was. And I still went back to that in 2010 in a work checklist that I prepared. And the ratios 
are still the same. Right now, we have it a bit more refined. It's around 10 to 1. And why these ratios are important, this is not a mathematical obsession of mine, which it's a mathematical obsession, but it's not important because I'm obsessed with that. It's because Lepidoptera are better known than, than parasitoids, way better known. Therefore, it is possible to forecast the diversity of parasitoid wasp based on Lepidoptera. And actually, I'm going to do that for Spain later in this talk uh, and, and show how much we have to discover yet for Spain. Um, and this is what scares me. When you look this, I, I showed this uh, uh, figure earlier. When you extrapolate based on the Lepidoptera microrastinia ratio, this is where you, where you end up. And these are the numbers that we're expecting to find. So parasitoids are going to be a million species. So we are talking about an order or two orders of magnitude higher than, than right now. So let's talk about diversity in different places uh, of the planet. And what a better place to start at the absolutely top north of the planet. So I'm talking about Alert, which is the northernmost continuously inhabited place on the planet at 82.5 degrees north in the Canadian island of Ellesmere. Northern than that is only the frozen Arctic Ocean, Santa Claus, and, and the North Pole. There's nothing else beyond that. So, and you see how conducive to biodiversity this place is. And this is a Hazen camp, is a, a bit inland in Ellesmere Island. It's a bit protected by the mountains. It's a still very rough and very, uh, you would say, well, there's no diversity here. Moving on. Wait, watch out, watch out. We found five different species of microastrine in this area, an area that we were not expecting to find anything. If we move a bit farther south to 60 degrees north, Hudson, <coughs> the mouth of the Hudson Bay, which is the largest bay in the world, this is Churchill, which is known as the polar bear capital of the world. Very interesting collecting there. We were collecting, and we had a guard with a gun the whole time because the polar bears really look at us as meals. Although in my case, a very small meal, but still they will take it. Um, this is most of the landscape you find is tundra, although farther south is a bit, uh, the boreal forest it reaches the northernmost limit. So in this area, this is mid-June, and the Hudson Bay is still half frozen. And look at these blocks of, of, of ice uh, in the Hudson Bay. We still found, we, we collected 1,000 species there between 2008 and 2006 and 10, the slide is wrong. And we found 79 species in 11 genera which at the time was the highest number of species for a North American locality. We use a lot of DNA barcoin. I will be talking about DNA barcoin briefly later in my talk. So let's move a bit southern to Ottawa, the, the city where I live, the capital of Canada. Uh, it looks nice in this uh, fall picture, but the, the reality is we get two and a half meters of snow every year and minus 25. So that's still pretty cool. And we got in 2000, uh, forgot the year, 2016, we studied around 2,000 specimens and found 158 species from 21 genera. So impressive that the Canadian National, um, this is the Canadian BBC, if you want. So the Canadian, the Canadian National News had an article talking about our work on Ottawa as a hot spot for wasps in North America, which is actually not true. It's just that we have studied Ottawa more. If you go more south, it will have more diversity. This was 2016. In 2022, I had an undergrad student who wanted to revisit the Ottawa data, and we studied 10,000 specimens and did 2,500 barcodes, and we are now at around 260 species, closing into 300, and there's only 300 for the entire North America. This is in the city. This is a one million people city in North America. So uh, if you look at these places that I was talking about, we are currently studying Lex Lexington, which I think is going to be more diverse, but it's 38 degrees north, about a bit like Spain, a bit south. Then Florida, it goes a bit uh, low because it's a smaller area and more human density. We know for a fact, because we have done uh, 25,000 barcodes from Costa Rica in a six, 
1,000 square kilometers, we have 1,500 species. When you look at latitudinal gradients, not only localities, this is what you find in North America and Central America, who knows? Uh, so for North America, we still know perhaps 25% of the species. We still have to add more than 1,000 species of this group of parasites was for North America. <coughs> and Central and South America, well, I don't know. I mean, this is when uh, there's a phrase in English, which I'm not going to say here because it's not appropriate, but this is when something hits the fan. Um, I don't know if you know the phrase, I'm not going to say it for the video, but um, I've been studying the word fauna. For example, New Zealand is, 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 is doable because it's a low diversity, although very unique, everything is endemic. We have around 200 species identified. We think it will be 300. The Arabian Peninsula, we did it in 2018. It's, again, it's a lot of desert, so it's doable. Madagascar, we are finishing, closing in with the material from California that sent us only 10% of the material. We have a study, 10,000 specimens. We are up to 500 species. But then when you hit the tropical areas, so we have a lot of much, a large amount of material from Thailand, at least 3,000 species. India, I don't know because it's difficult to exchange material with India. Central Africa, we are working in Uganda and Kenya, and there's more than 3,000 species we have identified. And South America, forget it. It's just impossible for a human being to work with that. 10, 20,000 species of microgastrinia parasitic wasp. So how about Europe? Actually, Europe right now is the area that has the highest number of microgastrinia. But again, don't get fooled. It's just because the area has been better studied. And, uh, and I think we know between 40, 50% of the diversity, uh, we still have a lot to do, but it varies depending on the region. For example, for Scandinavia, we have been working on Scandinavia for, for since 2009. I started with the Swedish Malay Strap uh, project, and I've been uh, visiting Helsinki. Uh, they have a fantastic collection. And we are getting there. We have, I don't know, 80% of the species already identified, and, and it's going to be probably 300 species, 350 for Scandinavia. So we are getting close there. Similarly with the United Kingdom, where it's not, in this case, it's not me. It has been a tradition of a study for more than 100 years, and it's Mark Cho, a, a fantastic person in, in Scotland, a mentor of mine. Um, with the tradition, we, we are getting close to that, and there was this checklist of British and Irish hymenoptera, which was in 2000, I forgot, uh, around 2016, 18, but it's already outdated because we keep finding more. But we're getting there with England. Germany, we started working. I have a fantastic PhD student working with me for the past three years. And she did 5,500 barcoin just from Germany and took the 300 species known from Germany. And we have around 450 barcodes. So we are getting there 60%, two thirds of the species I think we already know. We had a paper coming in January talking about this uh, work we are doing in Germany. And we are doing this because the Germans have money. We, we were able to do it the other way around, what they, what they call reverse engineering. So they did Barconi first, and then we identified based on morphology later. But then we have Spain, which has 5,000 Lepidoptera. I'm talking uh, La Peninsula Iberica. I'm not talking uh, the islands, just the mainland. Based on that, if my obsession with ratios are correct, you would expect around 500 species of microgastrinia from, from, from Spain. And we have 103, so we are missing 400. Uh, so we had a lot of work to do. And that's why I came here. I've been here for two weeks, enjoying fantastic hospitality from Mercedes and Piluca. And hopefully, we can continue working on this for the next few years and change a bit this situation. My last point of this topic is that to work with parasitic wasps, you need large, large collections. You cannot do that with a few specimens. I have seen close to half a million specimens all over the world in the CNC. CNC is the Canadian National Collection. We have, I have 150,000 microgastrine with at least 3,000 identified new species that I haven't had the time to describe yet. And we need these collaborations. This is, this is one of the main reasons I want to come to Spain. Because also, yo también hablo un poquito de español, y entonces quería, I wanted to 
seems to me a way not to strengthen, strengthen collaboration between the Canadian National Collection and Spain. Uh, so how do we deal with this diversity? This will be the last point of my talk, and I have still 10, 15 minutes, so we, we oh, more, more, yeah. more. Well, so okay, <laughs> but we can, we can cut it short when, when, when the time comes. I know it's, it's getting close to the lunch time, so. So microgastrin is a dark taxa, which is a concept that I didn't invent. It was, a, I forgot the year, was proposed recently. And a dark taxa means a taxon that has a lot of species, a lot of undescribed species, most of the species are singletons, only known from, sing from single specimens or a few. The keys usually don't work, and there are few or no specialists available. The European version of the dark taxa is pretty much the same. It's a bit less of the species, but then to compensate for that, you have too many described species, and this is bad because you need to find them in different museums, and many types are lost, and many specimens are old, and they are useless. You cannot do molecular work with them. You cannot see them. They are missing body parts. It's difficult. So when you are working with taxonomy, there are what's called two different impediments. There are taxon impediment, large number of undescribed species. But then you also have the superficial description, description impediment, which has been coined in 2021 based on some, some researchers that only use DNA barcoding and ignore the rest of the, of the taxonomy. The truth is that when you do taxonomy, usually most of the people still do the, what is called the traditional taxonomy. They basically mostly on morphology. And um, you could have the problem with dark taxon impediment or superficial impediment in this. And when you only rely on molecular, you are doing superficial descriptions as well. So, the trend that has emerged lately is more to trying to integrate approaches, combining as much as possible information. Has been called in 2022 by some colleagues working on braconid wasps. Uh, they call it turbo taxonomy, which is a term that I don't personally like, but it's a catchy term, so it, it, it has been used. Uh, a year later, a, a curculionic person also refer to this turbo taxonomy with a more elegant integrative taxonomy. He even had this very fancy workflow, how to do turbo taxonomy. I have done my own uh, incursions in turbo taxonomy. I have a paper in, 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 in Sukis talking about, I mean, the, the left side of the slide is a, is, 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 is a joke. So I didn't have that in, in Sukis, but the, the in, I'm not that crazy, or probably the editor would have allowed that anyways. But uh, I was talking about this in this two, uh, paper, um, when it's more efficient to use turbo taxonomy, how to use the data to try to speed up the description of a species. And the main thing we propose is that as much as possible, as intensively as possible, rely on DNA barcoding to, you know, Get your sequences. That's what we did with the Germany, um, the German student that I was mentioning, trying to get species sort to barcode species and then analyze them from morphology. I'm not advocating to only use barcoding, but to start that to speed up the recognition of a species. This is critical in groups like microgastrinia that are black and they don't look more. They, they are not really different from a morphological perspective. And of course, you but just when you start building a barcoding library, you can start doing matches with the species that are already identified. <clears throat> Barcoding is not perfect. I never claim it's perfect. But usually in Bracon, it was it's around 85, 90%. I would say that's a very good chocolate, I mean, very good accuracy for DNA barcoding. Um, and this is why barcoding cannot be taken alone. Um, I also advocate for using morphology, but morphology indeed has problems. Most of the species we know are known from one or two species. I already mentioned that. Knowing a group requires years of expertise and training and you know, hours spent with a microscope. And also morphological characters sometimes are often um, subjective or difficult to define. And in many hyperdiverse taxa like microgastrini, really there's not much in morphology unless you do morphometrics. But if you only have one or two specimens, you cannot do morphometrics. So this is a catch-22 situation. You, you cannot do anything there. So what I advocate in morphology is that in turbo taxonomy approaches, it doesn't have to be perfect. 
as long as there are other pieces of evidence that are put together and the species is defined by the combination of morphology, molecular, and still the morphology is useful because it can be used to link specimens that are too old and cannot be, uh, no DNA can be obtained from them. It can also link to species that are only known from descriptions because the, the specimens are gone, destroyed. So morphology has a, an important role to play, not, the unique, not only the unique. And with Marcho from Scotland, we started in 2014 trying to work this at a hollow Arctic level. And this is what I'm here in Spain, because one thing I realized working in Canada, and it's very easy to work in North America, the North America fauna, and the European fauna, there's a lot of overlapping. So, and there are very few really, not in Lepidoptera, I know Lepidoptera people tend to be more hollow Arctic, but in Parasiter was people tend to work North America and Europe, and there's a bunch of overlapping species. Back in 2014, there was 26% of the species were shared between North America and Europe, and now it's a bit higher. So we have started to try to get um, sequences from authenticated material, trying to create a barcoding reference library so that based on reliable identified microgastrine, we can build for the future a more integrative taxonomy at, at hollow Arctic level, Europe and North America together. In a per I only have three slides, so I'm fine. So in a perfect world, I wanted to say, you know, the types are in good condition, accessible, well characterized, other specimens are available, there are sequences, the material all and new can be put together and, and in a, an easy way, other sources of information exist, rapid methods can be used like tubular taxonomy, species recognition is, is facilitated by Morelqua and everyone lives happily ever after, in Cuento de Alas. But in real life, what happens is most of the name-bearing material, the types, are in poor condition, often are lost or inaccessible or poorly characterized or all of that together. Um, often there are not other specimens to compare and if they are there, they are in as poor condition as the types. Uh, it's difficult to establish links between the old and new specimens. Uh, other sources of information don't exist. There's no biology data. There's no, the taxonomic keys might be really poor. And this is the, re the, re the, re the, re the reality we have when working with parasitoid wasps. The species have a variable amount of information that goes from knowing basically next to nothing to a few species when we have a fair understanding at multiple levels. But the disparity of data within a taxon makes it very difficult to produce taxonomic revisions because the, 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 the knowledge is so uneven and so in uh, last year in a Congress of Hymenoptera, I proposed these ideas, which I hope to publish at some point, but I haven't had the time to organize, organize them better, but I wanted to share with you. This is my last slide, so we are close to almuerzo. But uh, um, I think that the species should rely mostly in molecular because it's arguably the easier and faster way, molecular operational units, uh, supplanting the, the commonly used OTUs. Uh, morphology should always be included because of the importance it has to link all and new specimens. All previously described species must be considered. I might be preaching to the choir here, but in Bracon it was, we have a colleague that has been describing a species only based on DNA barcodes and ignoring all previously described species. And this is a big problem in the parasitoid wasp community right now. That's what I mentioned this. For other groups, it might not be a problem. Um, and historical specimens should always be dealt with and incorporated to the point where they can be incorporated. I'm going to put one example because I have time. There's a, a, a number of Cotesia, which is a common genus in, in Microgastrini, described from Europe. And the only thing we have is the description, a, cocoon, a yellow cocoon mass. Well, that tells me it's a microgastrini, and it could be a gazillion things. The, type, uh, the types of those two species were in Germany, in a place where it was bomb uh, the, the Second World War, gone. So there's no material. The description says yellow cocoon mass. So 
there's no way to work around that. There, there's no way. So what, what I propose to do in this is what well, we account for that species. We mentioned it's for Austria, the species. And we leave it like that. We don't deal with that species anymore. We record it for the sake of completion. But then there's no point in talking about in the, where in the key could go, what sequence. There's nothing. We cannot. Even if we go back to the type locality and try to collect, there are several cotesia in that area that make yellow cocoons. So these are the cases where we need to and I know many taxonomies. I don't know about you. I don't even know if you're taxonomists. But anyways, uh, that they spend 20 years trying to solve absolutely every detail. And we cannot afford the luxury of doing that because we are in a biodiversity crisis. We need to describe the species. We need to provide results. So we need to do something. And in this case, that's, that's what I propose. Account for the species and move on. And leave it out for future analysis. And use some sort of ranking, which I. I didn't have time to show today. Hopefully, I will put that in a publication in the future where you can categorize the species based on the amount of information we have at present. And with that, I wanted to say thank you. I think I can say thank you in Spanish, I, I creo. En primer lugar, muchas gracias a Mercedes y Piluca que han sido fantásticas. Yo he disfrutado estas dos semanas. Me voy mañana para Canadá. Y, y vaya, que son las dos fantásticas. Yo estoy muy agradecido por, por la ayuda que he recibido de ustedes a José Luis, que está enfermo y no, ha podido, no, no hemos podido vernos. Yo estoy por ver a José Luis desde el año 2000. Eh, todavía trabajaba en Cuba. Emigré a Canadá, se cayó el proyecto que tenía con José Luis y después vino la pandemia y ahora él está enfermo y no hemos podido coincidir. Pero esta visita mía a, a este museo ha estado en planes desde el do, del año 2000. A Rob, que fue súper generoso y pudo acomodar mi presentación porque se suponía que era la semana pasada, yo no estaba aquí, muchas gracias por eso. A mis colegas de la, uni de la unidad de menorterólogos por soportarme a hablar mucho, bueno, ustedes también, y, y a los científicos con que hemos discutido mucho este pro pro punto de la turbotaxonomía. Y a ustedes por llegar hasta aquí, si leyeron hasta ahí, muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, Jose. That was really great. Very inspiring, very wise. So, some questions. Yeah, Alberto. Puede ser en español o en inglés. Sí, ah, bueno. Claro. Hablo un poquito de español. Venga, pues, eh, ¿en español o...? It's up to you. Eh, nada, eh, muchas gracias por la, por la charla. La verdad es que ha sido fantástico ver. Eh, siempre son muy bonitas esas charlas porque queda muy claro todo lo que queda por... Bueno, como tú bien has dicho, que no sabemos nada. Eh, desconocemos un montón. Este, al principio de la charla hablaste de, mencionaste unos datos de, de la reserva de Guanacaste en Costa Rica uh -huh. y entonces me vino a la, a la mente eh, este artículo en donde miraban, mostraron las polillas durante las mariposas nocturnas durante varios, varias décadas y entonces este, había tres fotos y se veía muy claramente en, la sábana, en esa sábana blanca ese declive de, de mariposas que, que, que han registrado en la reserva. ¿no? Y entonces este, pues me, ha venido ese, 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 esas, me han venido esa imagen de, de esas, ese cambio en las, en las polillas, en esa sábana blanca. Entonces este, mi has mencionado la crisis de la biodiversidad al final de, de, de tu charla. Supongo que es muy difícil hablar de, de crisis en este grupo cuando hay tanto por por conocer, pero simplemente, bueno, realmente es que no es una pregunta lo que te quería decir, simplemente es que tu pensamiento sobre, sobre esto, tus ideas, porque si son eh, parásitas obligatorias de, 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 de larvas de mariposas, en fin, no me enrollo Es más. muy buena Saber pregunta. Tu, tu opinión, Should I answer eh, in English? Uh, it's, it's, it's up to you. Well, then I'm going with the Spanish, anyway. Sí, es muy buena pregunta. Yo trabajé con Daniel Janssen por, por nueve años. En mis primeros nueve años en Canadá yo trabajé para, para Guanacaste. Sorprendentemente, y ese artículo Janssen vive dando presentaciones en el mundo entero acerca de esto, los microgastrinos no han experimentado ningún, 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 ningún decline. Se, man, no, se mantienen colectando una cantidad extraordinaria y cada año se sigue aumentando el número de especies. Tiene que estar pasando algo, tiene que haber alguna declinación, pero debe ser quizás, como tú dices, que no conocemos suficiente pero basado en el número de materiales que nos llegan a nosotros, todavía no hemos visto la declinación. Yo no estoy negando que hay declinación de especies, ¿eh? no estoy negando eso. Por supuesto, de hecho yo defiendo 
la crisis de la biodiversidad porque creo a veces que se habla mucho de global warming y no se habla tanto de la destrucción de hábitat y de la pérdida de biodiversidad que es tan importante como el calentamiento global. Así que yo no estoy negando eso. Simplemente para microgastrines no hemos podido encontrar. Igual me pasó en Ottawa donde estudiamos material histórico con material de ahora y estamos colectando una cantidad gigantesca de especies y de especímenes en Ottawa. ¿Qué está pasando? Yo he discutido mucho eso tratando de qué es lo que pasa. Puede ser que que por alguna razón son más resilientes al, 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 al calentamiento global, pero es que no tiene lógica, porque si los hospederos están, están declinando, deberían declinar ellos también. No tengo respuesta, solo para decir humildemente que no sabemos, pero que es una pregunta muy buena y que yo creo que sí, que hay que hablar de la crisis de la biodiversidad. Muchas gracias por tu pregunta. Um, how much evidence is there that each one of these microgastrini species has got a specialist hyperparasitoid as well? How, how, what is the proportion of hyperparasitoids? I mean, have you found a lot of evidence of hyperparasitoids and are they from the same group? Are they uh, no, they tend to be uh, calcid wasps or igneomonid wasps, two different groups of parasitoid, um, parasitoids. Usually the hyperparasitoids are not that abundant anyways, because it's, it's a matter of the food uh, chain pyramid. So the hyperparasitoids usually are very, very uh, rare, but we do get them a lot. And I rear caterpillars. I know, I know you hate when you get a parasitoid. I hate when I get a caterpillar, and I get my cocoon, and then nothing happens, and then comes out a hyperparasitoid. So, but uh, it's actually, I think I had the figure for Ottawa where I've been doing reading of caterpillars. It's less than 5%. So hyperparasitoids tend to be uh, low abundance anyways to start with. I will assume they are also more affected by climate change and biodiversity crisis. I mean, habitat destruction, but we don't know. And of the, of the hyperparasitoids you found, have, has a similar proportion of them been new species? I don't work with those groups. These are different super families. Did you send them off to? We, we, we were mm -hmm. together, yeah, yeah, we were together, but um, I cannot answer that because it's beyond my expertise. So. Te, te iba a preguntar que con, con estos números tan grandes de especies que piensas que tiene que tener el grupo y en este afán de ir tan deprisa en turbo, te podrías pasar a la, al environmental DNA, al DNA ambiental, pero hay, dejarías de tener vouchers. Es que, ya, entonces, pero hay gente que lo hace. Entonces, ¿tu opinión sobre eso? Ah, es que es un campo... Muy buena pregunta. Las preguntas han sido todas muy buenas. Mejor que la presentación. Teníamos que haber empezado con las preguntas. Eh, eh, yo estoy trabajando ahora mismo con, con unas muestras ambientales donde mantuvieron los especímenes. Al, al parecer, por lo menos en Canadá, pero no sé cómo sea aquí en España, al principio de, esta, de este DNA ambiental, por, ese, por ejemplo, tenían un bote de una trampa malaís y lo metían en un, una batidora, un grinder, y extraían el DNA, pero no te quedaban espécimes. Al menos en Canadá ahora están cambiando, están, lo, lo que usan es el alcohol de la trampa, del bote, entonces obtienen el DNA, pero están los espécimes. Entonces, yo estoy ahora empezando un proyecto que estamos nos han dado la, el metabarcoding, la lista, entonces estamos sacando, los, en este caso, los microgastrinos y, y mirando las cosas. Porque sin vouchers es un acto de fe. A, a ver, puede ser que en un futuro dentro de 50 años, cuando todas las especies estén con, con, con datos moleculares, uno pudiera hacer eso. Pero el problema es que, por ejemplo, no, no tuve tiempo a hablar de eso porque, bueno, no quise hablar cosas de, de filogenia. Pero, por ejemplo, el DNA barcoding no hay un número a partir del cual las especies son diferentes. En un mismo taxón, nosotros tenemos un mismo género donde especies diferentes tienen diferentes variabilidad. Los límites entre especies y, y hay um, hibridamiento, esa, esa frase tiene nada más que me la sé en inglés por haberla usado en inglés. Es decir, hay una serie, el, 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 incomplete linear sorting, ahora no sé cómo decirlo en español, uh, hay una serie de cosas que y están también los... Lo, los, los stop codes, hay una serie de problemas donde el, de, donde el DNA barcoding no funciona. Y donde, por ejemplo, Mar, yo mencionaba a Marcho varias veces porque yo sé que Rob lo conoce, um, que es un experto en, en biología de parasitoides. 
muchas veces la biología está en desacuerdo con el, el código de barras de energía. Y entonces cuando tú empiezas a mirar los datos de la biología, la biología es la que manda, si el gusano, la especie salió de ahí, de ese gusano, es la realidad. Y entonces empiezas a mirar los códigos de barra genética y la morfología y, y normalmente funciona cuando combinas las tres. Pero el, 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 el DNA ambiental, el, el metabarcónico, que es como le dicen en Canadá, es un riesgo si no hay voucher. Porque, pero, pero es el, a ver, sí, es, es importante, pero yo, te, yo estoy medio dividido ahí. No sé, no, no contesté muy bien, pero... Hola, yo iba a sugerir una cosa parecida, pero además, o sea, hacer metabarcording de la, del etanol de las muestras de museo o de las colecciones, pero además es que puedes hacer eh, una serie temporal y ver cómo efectivamente ha cambiado la diversidad de un punto en concreto. Sí. Si sí, haces metabarcoding de eso durante, un, no sé, 10, 20 años, si el, el sí. sitio está estudiado. Lo que pasa es que en el grupo de nosotros, cuando nosotros tenemos metabarcoding, sale lo más que sale es el género. La mayoría de las especies no tienen nombre. Y entonces tú tienes género X, especie 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, y tú no sabes si son realmente especies o no porque no se han estudiado. Y por eso es que si no hay, un, no hay especímenes de referencia, por eso es el valor de las colecciones como esta. Porque yo no discuto que en 50 años todos sean roboces analizando las muestras molecularmente que es lo que están abogando algunos, algunos científicos en el mundo. Ya, el, 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 el ejemplo de la Star Trek, la, 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 la serie de ciencia ficción, que tenían lo que se llamaba el tricorder, que era que tú apuntabas y te decía la especie. Es posible que lleguemos ahí, pero estamos por lo menos 50 años antes de llegar ahí. Porque la, la, la actual generación, eso es lo que más ha mí dormir tranquilo de noche, la actual generación de taxónomos se, y la próxima, los, los jóvenes que están aquí, tendremos que ligar, hacer el, el vínculo entre los datos moleculares y los especímenes. Y toda la información de 200 años que tiene este museo, por ejemplo, de especímenes, ligarlo con los datos moleculares. Si no, pierdes toda la, la, la historia que tienes de 200 años. Y, y, y puede ser que haya grupos donde ya se conozca bien o, o tengan poca diversidad. Estoy pensando en libélula, estoy pensando en mariposas diurnas. Pero en este grupo nosotros, se me olvidó decir, conocemos 5% de las especies. Tú realmente no conoces nada cuando conoces 5%. Pero es una... Es, sí, sí, ya, el futuro va por ahí. Gracias. Eh, gracias por tu presentación, muy, muy buena. Eh, a mí lo que me, me, me llamó la atención, bueno, dentro de todas las cosas que me llamó la atención, es para mí es el, el, un poco el, 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 el elefante en el cuarto de Elephant in the Room. En, en siempre que se habla de biodiversidad, ¿no? Y claro, ves los neotrópicos, los, los paleotrópicos y es... Sí, sabemos que está toda la diversidad ahí, pero es demasiado grande para lidiar con ello, entonces lo echamos un poco para un lado, ¿no? Y, y, y yo entiendo por qué, yo vengo de, de, de Ecuador, yo sé que lo que es hacer taxonomía con grupos neotropicales y es, 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 es que ya, ya no tienes cómo, ya se te acaban los caracteres, ya no, no, no sabes cómo. Entonces, en... Supongo que mi pregunta va en cuál es tu, tu opinión, vaya, de cómo, cómo, ves, cómo ves que podemos, la taxonomía puede lidiar con ese gran problema, ese gran reto, pero al mismo tiempo donde estamos hablando de que 40 o más por ciento de la biodiversidad mundial que está concentrada en esas áreas. ¿Cómo lidiar con ese reto? Eh, sí. Eso es lo que yo he propo, pro, propuesto con la turbotaxonomía que tiene que haber una forma donde no hagamos una descripción de tres páginas detallando la genitalia, el, 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 de la hembra, del macho, las, las proporciones, sino una, yo, yo abogo por lo que llamo descripciones diagnósticas pequeñas que sirvan para reconocer. Y lo que abogo también es por reconocer pequeños grupos. Es decir, tú puedes mirar a esa diversidad inmensa, yo la he mirado a Ecuador, y tú puedes reconocer 10 o 12 grupos que tienen, vamos a poner un ejemplo, la cabeza roja, las patas negras y el ala transparente. Entonces, dentro de eso hay grupo, a mí se me olvidó, hay un grupo de apánteles, una especie de apánteles que se describió en 1890 y le pusieron leucostigmus, que significa ala blanca, porque tenía el estigma del ala blanca. En Costa Rica, en Guanacaste, encontramos 62 como eso. Entonces, el, es irrelevante el, el, el estigma blanco porque hay en tantas. Y entonces, tú las agrupas todas y entonces haces caracteres para distinguir entre ellas que van a ser mayormente moleculares porque llega un punto donde hay mucha diversidad críptica 
que las especies lucen de lo mismo. Olvidé decir que producto de que todas estas especies usan virus simbionte para manipular el, el sistema inmunológico, no necesitan cambiar morfológicamente, porque lo que cambia es el virus. Están bien por fuera, están felices como son, no tienen que cambiar. Bueno, no, no, no estoy poniendo sentimiento, pero quiero decir, la, la, la variabilidad es, es química o genética. Entonces, usted mira ahí y luce lo mismo. Yo abogo por eso, por crear grupos de especies, species groups, y utilizar datos moleculares y biológicos donde quiera que sea posible. Pero, a ver, yo he estado describiendo alrededor de 100 especies por año en los últimos tiempos y todavía es insuficiente. Es decir, que tienes un, tienes, 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 tienes un punto. Tienes toda la razón. Hay que, hay que venir con... El, pero yo lo que me niego es a usar simplemente el código de barra genético e ignorar 250 años de historia de taxonomía lineal. Pero es mi opinión. Y me ha traído muchas discusiones con muchas personas en el pasado también. Gracias. We got one question online. Arturo Goldarracena pregunta si no crees que la descripción molecular única que se ha hecho de varios cientos de especies costarricenses eh, aportando una foto únicamente como descripción mor morfológica puede crear una gran confusión posterior en la taxonomía del grupo. Oh, por supuesto que creo que eso. Y de hecho, el, el, el artículo donde yo mencioné que yo he hablado de turbotaxonomía uh, fue en respuesta a ese, a ese trabajo. Uh, bueno, ni, yo tengo un artículo en su quise en el año 2022 que se llama, ni sé cómo se llama, uh, eh, es que eso es lo que pasa cuando... Uh, ¿Dónde está este aquí? El otro. Yo tengo un artículo en el 2022, Turbo Taxonomy Approaches, Lessons from the Past, Recommendations for the Future, Based on the Experience of Braconidae. Y ahí yo respondo a esa... La persona que está haciendo eso, yo no quiero caer en un ataque a la persona. Somos colegas, hemos publicado juntos. Yo inclusive me, considera, me consideraría amigo de él, pero él tiene un enfoque con el que yo estoy completamente en desacuerdo. Todos esos tipos van a terminar, por cierto, en Ottawa y la pobre persona que tenga que lidiar con ellos en 100 años va a sufrir porque esa foto lateral no significa nada y el código de barra genético ni siquiera se hicieron análisis moleculares detallados para delimitar especies. Ellos utilizaron nada más el Neighbor Joining Tree que hace Ball, pero no probaron muchos de los métodos que hay actualmente para delimitar especies moleculares, que hay muchísimos en estos momentos. Entonces, yo estoy completamente en desacuerdo de eso y pienso pero pienso que tiene un punto en tratar de, de que la comunidad de taxonomos piense que hay que aportar ahí ese artículo de turbotaxonomía del 2022. Pone mi apellido en Google y el turbotaxonomía y le va a salir el artículo, donde yo explico un poco más, no con esa, ese dibujo cómico, sino en serio, mis opiniones acerca de eso. Gracias. Ok, well. Great question and answer session. So um, just thank you once again for such a thought-provoking presentation. Um, if you want to continue chatting more informally with Jose, we're going to go and have a drink at the kiosk or now. Uh, so let's do that. And we don't have a seminar next week. We've had to postpone that one. So the next seminar is on the 1st of March. Uh, Jenny Ann Glickman coming from Cordoba to talk about human wildlife conflict. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.